For the past two months, gold has been down. Silver has also been down. What should precious metal stackers be doing right now? Gold is trading at all-time highs against about 80 fiat currencies right now. But did you know that gold is trading at a 123-year low on the gold to S&P 500 ratio? It is stupidly cheap. It's as cheap as it was when Thomas Edison created electricity. Wow. Should us gold and silver stackers hold for more price drops this summer? Or should we just charge in? Let's ask Lior Gantz, one of my favorite precious metals experts, to weigh in. Hi, Lior. How you doing? Good. Let's get caught up on what's going on with gold and silver. But first, Lior, allow me to set the economic stage just a bit. U.S. GDP, a measure of our economic productivity, it increased at 1.3% annualized rate last quarter. It was expected to grow 1.1%. So economic data you know, appears to be a bit stronger now. So that's one thing. Second, inflation, it continues. The Fed's Favorite measure of inflation, the PCE, was announced. It showed that high prices are still here. Another thing, the expectation is that the Fed is going to raise their rate. Again, a quarter basis points, most likely. And finally, Lior, we hear nothing about the whole banking crisis in the press. We talked about that last time. For me, that explains, I think, why... Gold just slid to a, a two-month low. Silver did pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, you talked about GDP. Um, interestingly enough, Germany entered a recession on their on their revised data, and that means that now the Fed is in uh, is in a pickle because um, in Europe you have the largest economy uh, in a recession, and in the United States uh, we have an economy that's uh, extremely resilient. So. I think that uh, the pickle that you have now is that the central bank in Europe cannot raise rates anymore with a recession in, in Germany. And now there's an arbitrage. Now there's, a, now there's a, a discrepancy because even if the Fed wants to keep raising, it will create uh, a problem because the Europeans cannot keep up. And that is a, it's something that the Fed will take notice of. Um, but uh, doing... Uh, seeing that revised data does raise the probability of another rate hike just around the corner in June. And when you couple that with point number two that you mentioned, the PCE coming in hot, um, and it, I don't know if you saw uh, Bernanke and Powell did a joint 45-minute um, Q&A uh, to remember uh, a Fed governor that, that passed away, but they, they used the opportunity to talk about um, economic policy and et cetera. This was two weeks ago. And in that, they talked about how resilient the uh, the unemployment numbers are and how much there's demand for employment in the United States, even after big tech layoffs and even with a frozen real estate market, there's still, it's not two to one anymore, but it's not one to one. There are more job openings than applicants that are ready to take those jobs. The main point that the Fed has made is that the natural rate of unemployment has dropped. In other words, we should not be surprised with these low unemployment numbers. They make sense when you have such a low participation rate in uh, the labor pool in, in general. So uh, this is the new normal, basically, <laughs> for unemployment? It, it, it certainly um, makes it logical as to why we have record low unemployment with a very aggressive rate hike cycle because you would expect um, a classic recession you would expect 10 percent unemployment more companies to lay off but then those laid off uh, uh, um, employees cannot find work that quickly and now they can't you get laid off you find another job in 2018 the fed t told you that they are going on an autopilot in regards to interest rate hikes we're just going to raise like 25 basis points everything seems logical yeah it seems logical but the market rejected it 
in December of 2018, we had a 20% drop in the S&P 500 in one month, the worst December since 1933. Why? <clears throat> because the markets rejected that logic. And what you have with the German economy is a potential rejection of uh, more aggressive rate hikes. We may see that, that if they raise in June, the market will say, well, no more, no more. If, you say, if they say the wrong thing in terms of um, in the Q&A session, if Powell is still very hawkish, then we may get a sell-off. The Fed is already open to questions by reporters about raising the 2% arbitrary to 3%. That was asked in the previous meeting. For now, it looks like the Fed is very happy with, hey, if, uh, if small businesses are making business decisions instead of hedging decisions, then it's okay if it takes four years for inflation to go for inflation to go back to the two percent. Well, wait a and minute. So, so are you saying that they are, in a sense, moving the goalposts around their two percent target? They're certainly okay if it takes three or four years to go back to um, below three percent. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So, um, uh, uh, that's really interesting because, for one, it means that they're capitulating. Now, th that's where it starts to hurt the regional banks. The regional banks can withstand this to a point. The problem is that the regional banks are actually the ones holding the commercial real estate mortgages. And so the regional banks not only have a balance sheet problem, but they have a real world problem where they are the ones that need to refinance the commercial real estate sector. And that's where I think the rubber meets the road on this and that's why i think that come september uh the expectation is that the fed will start to slowly cut um and the reason i, I think is not because a recession will come uh, i think it's because the regional banks will tell the fed when they talk uh over the phone with them all the time that they need to refinance office buildings and that is the real problem at the heart of the U.S. economy right now. Let's bring it back to gold okay. and silver. Are the lows in? The lows are definitely in uh, for both gold and silver. Um, they've, they've created lows in October of 2022. Um, we are in a situation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually shock, shock you. Okay. Gold is trading at all-time highs against about 80 fiat currencies right now. You knew that, right? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but did you know that gold is trading at 123-year low on the gold to S&P 500 ratio? In other words, gold today is as cheap as it was in 1971 when it was trading for 35 an ounce. As cheap as it was at the height of dot com when it traded for 250, and as, as, as cheap as it was in 1930 at the height of the Great Depression. The 123 year average for gold to the SP 500 is around 1.66 to 1. In other words, it is stupidly cheap. If the SP 500 today costs, uh, $4,100 for one point, it means that gold on average should trade for 1.66 of that. So in other words, it needs to trade at around $6,600 an ounce, not 2000. Wow. The gold to S&P 500 ratio today is just under half. It takes two ounces of gold to one point of the S&P 500. That's a 123 year low. That's an amazing way to look at it. Yep. Just think about it. Yep. It's as cheap as it was when Thomas Edison created electricity. Wow. It is remarkably cheap when you compare it not to fiat currencies, but to equities. Um, and people always think to themselves, well, why aren't gold mining stocks moving? Gold is, is an, an all-time high. It is not. It is extremely cheap. And now that it has formed this uh, fourth major bottom, 
We've had one in 1930, another one in 1970, another one in 2000, and another one uh, just now. Those act as a very strong support line. And if we go back to that average, gold price will have to go up by 200% or triple from here. Um, that is how you get a gold bull market in the mining company. So that's a really interesting observation that I think people are unaware of and they should be aware of. Um, and a second one, which is even crazier, is when you look at the HUY to gold index, in other words, the ratio between gold stocks and gold, um, it's even cheaper. It's also at a 23-year low. So if you think gold is cheap compared to the S&P 500, gold stocks are even cheaper compared to gold than they've been in the last 23 years. Um, Great opportunities I, there, Lior. Yeah, uh, it's, it's dirt cheap, uh, essentially. Wow. So I, I think what people need to understand is that that nominal price, people like to say, oh, well, it's not inflation adjusted. It's, it's not even that. It's not even the inflation adjustments that are uh, interesting here. It is just remarkably cheap in terms of its equities to gold ratio. Um, and, and there are other ratios like the, the, the silver to, to median home price, uh, which is a very important one. That's also trading at, at an all-time low. There are so many ways to look at it. Um, what I think the bottom line for, um, for investors to understand regarding gold and silver is that, is that let's start with gold. Gold trading here at an all-time high, it's not expensive at all. Um, it, it's, it's just not. Historically, it's super cheap. Silver is an, an even greater case of uh, undervaluedness. And I think that what you see now with Russia shutting down energy supply overnight to Europe just uh, a year and three months ago, with Chile nationalizing lithium, with uh, an acute problem with the supply of cobalt from uh, uh, Congo and other countries where uh, people are, are doing it uh, artisanal um, with slave labor, and with China renegotiating the way that oil trades with the Saudis in Yuan, you're seeing that the supply chains that we've all been living amazingly from in the last 30 years, especially after the Soviet Union collapsed and basically sold commodities to the world uh, at, at a subsidized low price. This world of hyper-globalization, where everything is at the snap of a finger, everything's always there. The shelves are always stacked. The uh, uh, Walmart can get stuff from China, put it in the, in, in the truck, it's there the next day. Amazon gets it to you the next day. Everything is the next day. Everything is so seamless. You don't even know where it's coming from. Where do they grow everything? Where do they do everything? Everything is, is so easy. That world is ending. And in place of it, there's a world with a real cost to commodities. There's a real cost to things. Because if you don't have the United States Navy patrolling the seas, it costs money to get things to you. And that's the world we're moving into. So I, I think that commodities are going to get uh, repriced to where they're they're now getting a real value. Yeah. Do you think the summer doldrums, though, typically seen in precious metals, are going to hold that back for the next few I months? I think that or? when I think that when the market is convinced that the Fed is about to cut, then uh, the rally will start. Okay. Wow. Not, well, not before. So okay. I think that what you're seeing now is 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 uh, adjustments to uh, rate hikes and. Um, Every rate hike is worth about 50 bucks uh, for gold. So um, that's why you see it uh, going down to the, to the low uh, 1900s. And I think that once the Fed looks to be cutting, uh, then the breakout will come. And what I showcased in the newsletter, um, and I, I can understand that you're a reader of it, um, would love to have everyone on, on that listening to this to just um, well, you I, know, get you, I get your website right on the screen right now, wealthresearchgroup.com. Check it out. Yeah, it's, a, it's a free newsletter. And by the way, uh, for your listeners, if they want to check out my entire portfolio, you can go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash portfolio and literally 
download that portfolio. That portfolio is up over 30% in 2023 uh, so far. So, Great. and it's comprised of companies that are not, um, this is excluding any no volatile companies. This, these are the companies to marry. So we have a lot of opportunity here and a lot of potential on the upside. So thanks so much, Lior, for joining. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, sir.